Welcome to Friday Beyond Spotlight. My name is Nick Chen, a lawmaker and lawyer with tech background. I'm your host for this episode. Friday Beyond Spotlights is delighted to present to you our special guest, William Louis, the director of Cullen Motorbus Company, which his great grandfather established in 1933. William is a successful businessman and a philanthropist who dedicates his time and talent to create a better world. He has founded an educational foundation that helped identify promising students from mainland China and Hong Kong to study abroad, see the world, and give back to the society. William, welcome to Friday Beyond Spotlights. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, just a small correction. Mm. My great grandfather actually started the company in 1921. Oh. At that time, it was called Dao Long Hei Te. Ah. It wasn't Count Motorbus. Right. And in 1933, 1933, we got the franchise, and that's why we count 90 years from 1933. But in fact, if you started from the day my great grandfather started it, mm. it's 102 years old. William, you joined the company in your 30s. And now you've grown the company to be a fleet of over 4,300 buses and running over 400 routes. How did you define success then? And how would you define success now? Success is different in different stages of life. When I was in my 30s, I thought the more money you make, the more successful you are. But as I grow older now, I think success is more like if you're able to contribute and help people, then you, know, you, you, you really feel that, I mean, we have like, oh, about three million, 3 million people a day riding our buses. So it feels really good that I'm actually helping 2.8 million people every day to go to work, to go to school, to go to the market. I just feel very proud of the company and I feel, you know, I, you know, I like to contribute now. That's great. That's uh, it's more about bringing them to their destination. That's right. But not just day to day, right? It's also about social mobility. Exactly, it? exactly. And uh, we help the elderly, we encourage elderly to come out more. That's why I really enjoy you know, my company, being able to help people to get out of the house and communicate. We've been chatting about COP28 and uh, what's been happening uh, recently. But, so I know you're a really green person. Um, so I also appreciate that your company will be investing hundreds of millions into buying new electric and hydrogen powered buses. Uh, and that you plan to invest over a billion dollars to invest in uh, installing electric charging facilities. That is a sizable investment. Is KMB a cash cow? How did the <laughs> staff manage to convince you to um, make that kind of investment? Well, uh, KMB is a privately owned company running a public transport. We do not get any subsidies from the government whatsoever. We buy our, all our buses ourselves. We build all our depots ourselves. We buy all the land to build the depots ourselves. Oh. So this is a very difficult environment yeah. to work in, right. and we are succeeding. And that's why I'm so proud of our company mm. and my management. And we have a great team, and we're not spending these billions of dollars in one go. <laughs> it's actually spread up to 2040, mm. because we can't obsolete the present diesel buses now. Mm. So they have to retire, and right. then we will, every year we buy a few hundred to replace them with electric buses. Mm. And it's not like one, one payment. And then I'm sure buses will get cheaper. Electric buses will get cheaper as mm. we, you know, this is just a number that we're talking about now, but I'm sure electric buses will be cheaper in the future. And also we're not investing in hydrogen power fuel buses mm. because until the day they can produce green hydrogen, we will not consider. Do you know how to make hydrogen? You have to use electricity. Mm. Why don't you use electricity right away? Right, right. And why do you have to use electricity to make hydrogen? Uh. That is totally silly to me, mm. right? Mm. So, uh, and it's highly inefficient, and you have to push the hydrogen into a bottle. And that takes a lot of energy as well. So the efficiency right now is about 40%, mm. whereas if you use ele electric, it's nearly 90%. Mm. So for now, we will not consider hydrogen until one day they can make hydrogen with renewable energy. Right. Uh, so in the company's effort to go green, um, is that part of your personal you know, leadership? You know, we have a group, a group of directors with very wise people. Mm. I'm probably the least wise. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, uh, we've been talking about this for a very, very long time because, you know, as you know, the, the weather is changing mm. more and more severe now. Mm -hmm and global warming is one of the biggest issues, and the oil price is really making our cost very unpredictable. Mm. And that is something that we are kind of 
you know, this is the direction that we have to move to because, you know, with electricity, at least we know how much we're going to pay mm. every month. Mm. But with oil price fluctuating up and down, as a public, uh, publicly listed company, mm. I don't want my profit to go up and down and, volat you know, and being volatile. Right. And I don't think my shareholders will be very happy. Well, uh, William, you were born as a Louis uh, and into a life of, some would say, comfort and excess. Yet you're better known as a humanitarian, philanthropist who quietly supports many charitable organizations. When and why did you decide to give back to society and promote the well-being of others with such strong passion? It was uh, my grandmother. Um, I spent a lot of my childhood with her. Mm. And we used to visit uh, old people's homes and um, disabled children. Um, you know, she bought, built a lot of facilities for, for the very, very underprivileged. Mm. And uh, I started this when I was about six or seven years old. I used to visit with her. Right. And then I didn't enjoy it at the time. But then uh, when she passed away um, in the funeral, a lot of people came up and thanked me. And there, are, there were a lot more that my grandmother did that I didn't know about. Mm. So, I, I, so I think what she did was re really honorable. She did charity without telling people. Mm. And I think charity should be done like that. And, and I think it's more, you know, it's more meaningful right. than to, you know, you don't use charity to try and gain some kind of recognition right. or anything. So I think, I think you know, my grandmother uh, inspired me a lot. And then I changed her idea oh. because I'm a lazy person. So I just want to help a few very bright scholars and hopefully they, get, they can change the world. Mm. And luckily I started early. And so they are my older scholar are in their 40s now, and, uh, and they really are like 100% successful. Share with us um, mm. about your educational foundation. The main one that I do is named after my grandfather, uh, William S. D. Louis, mm. and I'm William L. K. Louis. Mm. So uh, I, I love my grandfather very much. Mm. You know, my grandfather passed away when I was three, and I, I really remember the time that, you know, we, we had a great time playing on the swing in the garden, and and uh, things like that. That's why I named my scholarship after him. And I used his name to support scholars from China. Mm. Uh, from yeah, Beijing, uh, in the beginning, the, mm. the first batch, the first few batches were from China. I sent them to the top boarding schools in the UK, mm. all the top boarding schools, because I think networking is so important in one's life. Right. I have to stress on this relationship thing that, you know, human is, a, is all about relationships and all about uh, 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 how you get on with others and how you can achieve. You can't do everything yourself, so you need to have a team and all that. So, right. so, so, so that's why um, I sent them to all the best boarding schools in the UK, and then they met all the, the people that are in later on in, in life. Mm. That, that's why they're so successful now. And I also give them my network. As a global citizen living through or witnessing war, natural disasters, stagnant economies and other global challenges. Can you help us understand what important questions and issues, uh, you know, for emerging and established philanthropists to handle, um, you know, when faced with difficult political, social or financial times? Yeah. One doesn't have a crystal ball to, you know, to, to tell you what's mm -hmm. going to happen. But um, I, I do read the news all the time and I do feel people are suffering from war. You know, I have the heart to try and help those victims. I actually came across a, a Palestinian orphan. The whole family is killed. He's 14 years old mm. and um, very, very sad case. And then I tried to reach out and help this person. But then on the other hand, I think, is he so broken that is he able to be helped? Mm. I don't want to raise another monster, mm. right? So, so it's very hard to, uh, to see how war and global warming and all these things are. Mm. I just try and do my best. I do my, I do my best to help. And I also make my scholars do their best to help. Mm. I can only control what's around me. Mm. I cannot control anything outside my reach. William, you have a beautiful home. Thank you, Nick. Um, William, um, your educational foundation that bears the name of your grandfather um, have inspired so many people, helped so many underprivileged children to get the best education in the world mm. and see the world. Yeah. Very early on, uh, 
literally from the first day, and I told them that they would never have to pay me back. Uh, and I asked them to pay forward, and then they asked me what does pay forward mean. So at the time, there was a movie called Pay It Forward. Mm. It's about a kid helping three people unconditionally, and then he spread this throughout, you know, and then everybody was doing helping three people, and then the, mul the multiplying effect. And then now they named their scholarship Pay It Forward Foundation. William, what advice have you given your protégés? I tell you what, you can meet one of them. Here is my scholar. Oh, great. I get the, oh, Elwood. Hi, hi, I'm Nick. Hi, Nick. Have a chat. Thank you. Thank you. Elwood, um, how did you meet William? So in 1995, um, he had this uh, idea of a foundation and he um, met through a friend of his, uh, some of the top schools had masters mm. um, in Beijing. And mm. uh, each school roughly recommended 20 students to come for the interviews. Mm. And luckily, my headmistress selected me. So how has his support his philanthropic activities change your life? Well, I certainly wouldn't have gone to Oxford University without his help. Mm. And I most probably wouldn't have had the 20 year finance career that I had. I worked for some of the top financial institutions in the world. And for that, I'm uh, thankful and grateful. I to congratulate you for Thank all the good work you've done. And certainly congratulate Thank you for you raising much. such a great mentee. Thank you for coming, Thank Nick. you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Welcome back to Friday Beyond Spotlight. Our special guest today is William Louis, a prolific philanthropist and a successful businessman who never goes unnoticed wherever he goes. Who is William Louis behind Spotlight? Who or what defining moments in his life shaped him into who he is today? In this show and tell segment, William will show us an item that has a special meaning and significance in shaping him into who he is today. William, could you show us this special item? Yes, this is the book that I produced, we produce. My wife and I and my two kids produced this book together mm. to remember my mother-in-law, Christina Lee. And uh, the design of the, the cover is done by me and uh, her name is Lok Nan Kwan. Lok is the same sound as green, so that's why the background is green. An is a flock of birds, so this plate. Mm. And because she's famous for cooking and uh, so we use a plate, and then she's famous for her Changsam, and Quan is Changsam. Oh. And that's why I designed this. This is the cover. Very clever. Yes. And you and made this together, you made this. And together we to... made this. Um, I took all the photos for her dresses mm. and the food. Mm. And um, Ooh, dresses lovely. and the food. The favorite dish is this uh, crispy aromatic duck. Mm. And all these foods are reproduced by my daughter. And she after cooked she cooked them. it, and then I go and take the picture. My son is holding all the, the lighting and everything. <laughs> so, so we, you know, so, and then I buy all these uh, cloth, uh, you know, to enhance the, uh, the, the photos, the, the food. And, uh, and my wife mm. wrote all the recipes. Wow. And my son wrote all the uh, must have taken, introduction. And, must have taken uh, months. It's taken about it's less than a year because mm. it's a long project because all all her dresses are Oh wow this is beautiful. In in all her dresses are in the cupboard and we have to steam it and then we have to buy mannequins to dress it up. Mm. Every every Saturday and Sunday we were taking pictures of dresses and food. And uh, Marie, my wife, was the mm. one who decide which one because because all these dresses are color you know, color coordinated with the food. Oh, so, so, so every page, page is uh, uh -huh. yellow and then <laughs> yellow. Yes, <laughs> eggs, yes, yes. Right? The yes. steam eggs with uh, crab claws. Mm. And uh, yeah, so we're quite proud of this project. It's a really? collaboration between the whole family. Food is the key to many hearts. That's right. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So, you, you all, so, do you continue this tradition? You have a gathering at your home? We, the Louis family, has mm. a family gathering every mm. Sunday afternoon. So every Sunday without fail, mm. um, I have lunch with my, my father's sister. That, you know, she's the only Louis mm. left now. And every Sunday we have this family tradition. Um, we have to have pretty good excuse not to attend. Mm. Uh, otherwise, it's kind of like understood that we have to meet every Sunday. Mm. And I'm going to keep this up. You've told me 
you've had some not so success ventures, uh, but you shot back and thrived. Uh, did your failures help to shape you into who you are today? Of course, um, failure is fantastic. You know, at, at the time of failure, mm. you know, you feel so down and so terrible. But looking back, all these failures is what shaped me. Mm. My company is big, and there's accidents, and there are staff who are not happy, and you know. So, and then we we try our best to, you know, to have the best welfare and you know to look after them, and and uh, you know you learn from setbacks. So I appreciate setbacks. In fact, I deliberately create setbacks for my kids so that they can. Uh, they can learn from it. Oh, by the way, Nick, um, I'm planning to write a book on anti-aging, and I'm trying to inspire people in China and Southeast Asia um, how to stay young and active. And um, and one of the chapters in the book is about philanthropy. You can read about diets and supplements mm -hmm. and exercise. There's too many people writing books about that already. Right. One of the biggest chapters in my books is about philanthropy because what makes you happy internally can keep you young. And then by interviewing all these young children, young people, they really inspire me. Mm. And I keep on learning new things every day. Mm. And keep, you know, to keep curious, uh, you have to be curious. Otherwise, you can't improve. Mm. In fact, the book is very important because it's all about me, how I stay young and healthy. Is it a state secret to disclose your age? 64. You don't look it at all. Yeah. You turn around, right? 46. <laughs> I'll be, I'll be 65 in August. Oh, yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. You really keep... <laughs> so now we learn your secret of not only success, but also, also ageless. You are an heir to an empire and you inherited a fortune. But it's rumored that you plan to bequeath most of your wealth to your educational foundation, leaving nothing to your own children. Is that a rumor? I had an interview about uh, 25 years ago, and I talked about that, mm. and I've changed my mind now because okay. <laughs> <laughs> the reason being, you know, I've, I, I, I'm proud to say that I've raised two very decent kids, mm. and I'm, I'm, I, I can trust that uh, they can uh, use my inheritance to do good, to, to do, do good, and uh, and they, and my son is very uh, careful and. Mm. Uh, He's a risk taker, but then he's also a calculated risk taker. Mm. And um, he knows exactly my investment strategy. Mm. And we agree on that. Great. And I, he's 31. So, so now I've seen, you know, at the time when I turned five <laughs> years ago, he was only a child. Mm. So that's why you know, Maria and I thought, oh, if, we, if they knew that we were going to give them everything, and then they would be like our friend's kids, who would just go to the yacht and then smoke a $5,000 cigar and then drink... Uh, you know, Chateau Lafitte, as you see, I have nothing like this here. Mm. And, uh, uh, and I don't want my children to be like that. And in case they were like that, mm. then I would, you know, like you donate it all to the uh, educational institutions mm. or my scholarship. Mm. Uh, but now, you know, they've graduated. My son has got his PhD from Oxford and in bio biotechnology. And, uh, and now he's into, uh, he's running his own startup. And mm. uh, I... I'm I'm perfectly happy, you know, um, giving them the 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 you know the inheritance. Yeah. In preparing for this interview, I actually interview a lot of your friends. A common phrase came up that you have a magnetic personality. <laughs> Not sure if you've heard them saying it in front of you, but do you know what that means? I'm trying to be entertaining all the time. So whether it's the dinner party or even when they ask me to give a talk about philanthropy at Oxford, I always make it funny. And uh, I think laughter plus knowledge always sticks to people because if you make a child learn with a whip, they will never learn it as well as if I make them laugh. <laughs> True. So I learned to, to be entertaining. And so, I mean, it reflects on my charity performances. Like I always do something very, very different from others. Mm. Uh, I've even done the Chippingdale performance for, <laughs> for, for the breast cancer, for the pink ball. And they were so shocked that I was stripping and, uh, and I raised $6 million in 15 minutes. Well done. Yeah. Using your talents. Yeah. What else did you do? You, oh, you have singing. singing talent. Yeah, right? singing. Yeah, yeah. I, I sang with the Hong Kong Philharmonic. Mm. My daughter was playing the piano. Mm. And then the orchestra, the 90 people orchestra was playing for me and my daughter. Yeah. To raise funds for the Hong Kong Philharmonic. I remember that. That yeah. was really yeah. well done. 
And then I sang with, uh, tried to sing Chinese songs with, uh, with the Chinese orchestra because mm. Chinese orchestra can play jazz because they're so talented. Mm. They use all the Chinese instruments and they can play any Western music. Wow. But I refuse to, mm. to sing any, you know, like English songs with the Chinese orchestra. So I learned the first time I performed a song in Putonghua. Well done. Yeah. And, uh, and I like to challenge myself. Mm. And then my friends don't expect me to ever... I mean, every, that's why they come to support me because they think, what is good William going to do? <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. So yeah. bring them in. Exactly. Mm. So you keep them surprised all the time. Mm. And being creative is very important, I think. Mm. I like to be creative. Mm. So a, a true magnet. <laughs> now we come to our fun rapid fire segment where we will get more up close and personal with you. <laughs> okay. William, I will fire some rapid questions at you where there are no right or wrong answers. And you please simply say the first thing that comes to your mind. Right. Are you ready? Mm. Favorite type of music? I like uh, R&B. Favorite book? Uh, Agatha Christie's. Comfort food? Junk food. <laughs> Favorite sports? Everything. Last movie watched? Napoleon. What did you last search online? King Louis XVI. Um, the French Revolution relating to Napoleon, the movie. Mm. Favorite place to travel? I used to like New York, Tokyo, London. But now, uh, mainland China. Any cities in mainland China. I want to explore mainland China from now on. Favorite place in Hong Kong? Hong Kong Club. First job? <laughs> My first job was uh, miserable. I was an accountant. A person you admire? My grandmother. Hidden talent? I don't have any hidden talent. It's all shown to the world. <laughs> <laughs> Magic wish to self-improve? I wish I can have more patience. Proudest moment? Uh, when my son got his uh, uh, defil from uh, Oxford. And uh, he's the first Louis in the <laughs> Louis family that has a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> Nicest compliment you received that touches you? Uh, I'm uh, entertaining and funny and make people laugh. Title of your autobiography? Ageless Advantage. Qualities of your parents that you admire the most? They are very straight and I didn't like it, but now I appreciate it. Biggest fear? Losing friends or losing family. Advice for your younger self? Be more patient. Describe yourself in one word. ADHD. <laughs> thank you, William. Well, thank you all for joining us on Friday Beyond Spotlights. That's all the time we have today. See you next time. William, um, it's like if you keep your high moral standards, uh, you could see through the floor and see a lot further, couldn't you? Yes, you can. I'm very lucky to be uh, brought up here and uh, look at the development of Hong Kong. Mm. And uh, this really is a place for you know, for uh, opportunities. A land of opportunities. A land of opportunities, yes. Brilliant.